This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to Episode 210, and the subject this week is private equity. And I don't think you could have found a better guest, Ben, than Ludovic, Professor Ludovic Falapu, who is a Professor of Financial Economics at University of Oxford Said Business School. And wow. I learned so much in this conversation about the world of private equity. And this is from an academic who's been deep in the weeds for a long time, but so many great lessons from the true cost of investing in private equity, the biases that go on in the industry, this whole, the math of IRR is unreal. The benefit of looking forward, not backwards. What a great conversation. He's also the author of a book, which I'm going to go read now, uh, Private Equity Laid Bare. It's a textbook, I think. Be careful. It's fine. It's going to be heavy. I, it's, I'm, I'm okay with that. Like, I'm sure there's some great parts to it. But I was, I was really taken with this conversation, especially there's so much demand, uh, supply and demand of private equity right now in the marketplace. So fascinating. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean... We did an episode on on private equity with the two of us a while ago, and and Ludo's work was was a, a major source for that, and that's why I wanted to have him on. I mean, you start digging into his papers, and he's been he's been specializing in in private equity for I think f- 15, 15 or sixteen years now, where this yep. has been his main focus of uh, of research. So he's looked at it from so many different angles. He's he's looked at so many different data sources and ways of of uh, tr- trying to figure out what's going on under the hood in in private equity, so his his insight and his ability to speak to the to speak to the data, but it's it's even funny, right? Like, you, there's no easy answer, as you'll see in the episode. There's no easy answer to the question of how has private equity done. It's mm-hmm. like you have to understand all of the nuances and caveats and how private equity performance can be assessed, and then you can sort of start to get an idea of how of how the asset class is done relative to public equities. But th- there's a lot of uh, a lot of layers to peel back just to get to that the answer to that question how how has private equity performed, uh, and then of course the follow on question is how should we expect it to perform like you mentioned a minute ago and that's uh, that's also very interesting. But as we <laughs> just as work on fees, I mean, what do you pay to own a private equity I- investment as a limited partner in a in a fund? Uh, well, it's it's not what you would expect when you look at the the two and twenty fee structure, for example. I mean, Ludo's estimates are between like, I think he said five and seven. I think in one of his papers, it was even as high as eight, mm-hmm. uh, 8%. Or maybe that was the unpublished version of the paper and it went down to seven. But anyway, they're very high, the fees. Um, so that question of what are the net of fee expected returns for this asset class? Well, yeah, maybe uh, maybe not so compelling, which is one of the things that we, we talked to Ludo about quite a bit. So Ludo has a master's in economics and a master's in mathematical finance from the University of Southern California and a PhD in finance from INSEAD. Anything yep. else to add, but, Ben? No, no, Ludo's he's super qualified to talk about this, but like I said, he's had his head in this for, for years, and, and it really shows when he starts speaking about it. So uh, I, I think people are going to enjoy, people who have any interest in private equity or have thought about it as an asset class uh, are going to benefit tremendously from listening to this conversation with, uh, with Ludovic. So let's go ahead to the conversation. Professor Ludovic Falipu, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to be talking to you. To start, can, can you tell us what asset classes are included in the broad term private equity? So uh, in my book, I, I, I spend most of the first chapter just trying to explain what the different uh, terms mean, because it means it's used in different um, ways by different people. So technically, private equity is, is anything that is private and equity. So it's kind of um, the complement of public equity. So public equity is any public is any equity that is open to the public, which means it's what you get on stock exchanges all around the world. So private equity, technically, it's everything that is equity, but you cannot access publicly. So uh, my dad is at a bakery. Uh, the equity in that bakery was private equity, right? Uh, my mom had a farm. It was private equity. Um, so all of these would be technically private equity. Now, when usually people talk about private equity, they don't talk really about all the equity that is private. 
So what they really talk about is what, we, what I called in the book institutionalized private equity. So it means that you know, there, there is an intermediary that, that institutionalized that space, like you know, the bakery of my dad was not, was not you know, nobody was invested in it except, except um, him. So uh, institutionalized private equity is when you have some third parties coming in, um, and so t t it can be a family office, it can be uh, a pension fund doing it directly via funds, uh, via funds of funds, then funds. So there are some intermediaries and, and there is a line that is pretty blurred. So for example, you can have a family office, imagine that my own money is being managed by a, a, a professional and these people then buy a bakery is that then institutionalized private equity or not? Like it's kind of my own money. I'm just investing in a bakery. I own it fully, 100% me. What's the difference between that and just when my dad was owning his, his mm -hmm. bakery? Um, so, but but because I would go via an, an official family office, although official is isn't clear, we don't register family offices. It would it would probably fall under institutionalized private equity. People would see that as private equity. So you have this institutionalized private equity, but sometimes within that. People, for some weird reasons, they, when they talk about private equity, they mean only leverage buyouts. And that, and that is very strange because there is absolutely no rationale for doing that. So sometimes when people say, oh, you have venture capital, uh, you have real assets, and then private equity. And you're like, no, that's leverage buyouts. Like, like <laughs> all the other things you mentioned are private equity. Um, and sometimes people also put private debt into private equity, right? Which is, you, you should do, <laughs> then we, we should call it private capital or private markets. So there's a lot of confusion mm. in vocabulary. So this question seems trivial, but it's actually quite complicated, I'm sure. But the answer was longer than you hoped for. <laughs> no, that, that was perfect. So w when we're talking about private equity data, we're, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions about that. Are, are we talking about everything or, or is it VC or is it yeah, my specialty is leverage buyouts. So I, okay. I tend to, to, to comment most in leverage buyouts. Most of leverage buyouts is American. Uh, this is also where we have most data. So most of like what I've worked on and, 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 and things we will talk about will be American leverage buyouts, really. Okay. Um, but we, we can try to um, uh, specify it. Okay. So what is the end-to-end -end process for investing in a typical private equity fund? So... So, so first you need to, so if I am the one raising money, if I'm the fund manager, um, I will need to have some sorts of track records. Um, it, I, I cannot just raise money just by showing an ICV of, um, so you will need a track record in investing and then you can raise a fund. If you don't have a fund, then there are some other ways. You, you, need, you can do some consulting first or you can do deal by deal and things like that. But let's say it's a fund you're raising. So if I'm raising a fund, uh, I present this track record to a number of investors in a so-called roadshow, like you would for normal IPOs or anything else. You go on a roadshow, you may be uh, with a, uh, a placement agent to help you or, or, or doing it yourself. And then you're going to see some institutional investors, or it can even be individuals that are rich enough to, to invest. And then you are going to have a limited partnership agreement that they're going to sign. And what that involves for them is that they are going to give you the equivalent of a credit card. They're going to say, so if Benjamin wants to invest in my fund, he's going to say, okay, I commit to you 50 million um, and you have five years to draw it. So mm. it's as if he gave me a credit card with 50 million on it. And during the next four, five years, I, I just draw it when I want to. Again, but going back to what we just discussed, this is very much a leveraged buyout fund. So a venture capital fund, maybe the, 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 the credit line lasts for 10 years. So the commitment um, will be for 10 years. If it's a private debt fund, it will be more for three years. So real estate would, would be sometimes a bit closer to three as well than, than five. So you would have some idiosyncrasies that depends on the type of investment. But basically, you would have this, this commitment, which is a very important thing. You have a deadline and you have a certain amount of money you can draw from institutional investors. And then you can do, you know, you can invest pretty freely. Uh, um, usually you try to do what you said, but you invest um, this, this money and then you hold the asset three to five years and, and return the money when you exit the, the asset. So usually if it's in a fund, we're going to invest in about 20 things. Uh, and each time I exit one, I give the money back. So 
It is called a buy to sell model. I'm buying stuff in order to sell. That's very important because it's a very different mindset than uh, mm-hmm. a Warren Buffett or, or, or a usual mutual fund, etc. And particularly, the deal is that I'm approaching Benjamin and I say, look, I'm, I'm a specialist of French bakeries. I know how to consolidate bakeries. I know how to speak to bakers and I can make b- bread better than anyone else. And, and, and then he will say, okay, so let, let's do that and buy a number of bakeries and, and uh, similar things, like maybe cho- chocolateries or things like that. And um, I'm going to deploy the, this strategy. But each time I get into like a bakery, I, I have a plan to make this bakery worth more and I execute that plan. And I try to sell it as, as soon as possible once people have re- I, I can, can price in the fact that I've made it worth more. Um, so that's the model that I'm, I'm coming in to make an, an asset worth more as soon as it's worth more and I can exit it, I do. And I return the money to Benjamin. Okay. So you, you mentioned the, the fund manager, hopefully having a track record that they can go and that they can go and sell. What are the challenges with measuring the performance of private equity managers? So the, the challenge is that when you have an asset that is non-traded continuously, we don't know how to measure a rate of return. And people are very much used to that. They say, oh, if I invest with you, are you giving me 10% or 20%, right? And that doesn't exist in a private investment. And, and the reason is pretty simple. I can give you as an example. Imagine that I buy a house with your money for $1 million uh, and I, I sell some of it or some rights to it for a million like three years later. And then I sell all of it for another $2 million, um, eight years later. What was my rate of return on this investment? It's actually not possible to calculate it. it. You would need to have only one cash distribution and one cash investment to calculate the rate of return. So, so a rate of return doesn't exist. So when people come up with some kind of shortcomings, uh, and so that leads to all kinds of abuses because there, there is no uh, measure of rates of returns. Um, even for measures that are simpler, called like multiple of money, which is like how much you gave me back compared to what I gave you, even that can be manipulated in different ways. Um, and because there are no rules in general, you can do all kinds of things. So, for example, hmm. imagine I worked at KKR uh, and um, I worked on a number of deals. Some of them I did the Excel spreadsheet. On some others, I, I was in the investment committee but didn't say anything. On some other ones, I did say something. Uh, on some other ones, I did the Excel spreadsheet but it was kind of influential. So I was vaguely, I, 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 I can define involved the way I want. And then when I go to raise money to investors, I say, I was involved in four deals at KKR. Nobody can check. So I can just take like four amazing deals at KKR. And, and, and I wouldn't lie. I was kind of involved in all of them, right? But, but I just, I'm quite free to define what is it I was involved with, right? So you would have all kinds of things like that. You know, like I can raise money. Um, I, I can have like, let's say, made 20 investments in the past. 10 of them were successful, 10 not. And I can tell you that, um, going forward, I want to invest in hospitals in the U.S. And this is my track record relevant for hospital investing in the U.S. Well, yeah, it just happened to be my, my, my 10 investments were in that space. And I'm just not telling you that I tried something else and it failed. Like maybe I invested in Asia and it didn't work. I'm never lying because that would, that, that, that would be uh, uh, very problematic. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm not giving like the full picture. So, so the problem when you have no rules is that you 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 it's a wild west, right? It's very hard to, to assess a track record of someone. If, if, uh, so, of course, you will have some diligent investors that will do phone calls. They will try to call like the previous guys that were in the fund saying, what else this guy invest into? It's, it's a bit weird. He said he had only 10 investments, but he had raised the fund. It was like bigger than that. So how does that work? Um, but, and even with like what I was just uh, uh, alluding to about like performance track record, you could probably obtain the full cash flows and try to reconstitute things and so on, but it's n- never going to be really trivial. It's not like when you have a morning star that gives you the stars of mutual funds and, and a track record where everything's standardized, you can compare across <clears throat> funds and so on and so forth. You would not, not have that. So it's tricky. Hmm. How, how are, so you, you mentioned the buy to sell model. How are investments <clears throat> that have not yet been sold treated when a manager is reporting on their performance? Yeah, so that, that, that's another thing, right? So if, you, if an investment is held for five years and you have five years to invest, roughly once you are reaching your year free to, uh, you need to raise a new fund, right? Otherwise you're going to run out of money. Um, so every two to three years, you're going to raise a new fund. But after two years, 
you have maybe you have exited one thing if you're like extremely lucky and then the rest is, is not realized even when you raise your third fund you rate you your five or six you may have one or two exits but you have fully invested one fund or the rest is or the other 18 investments you you don't know uh, the value even at form four you still have quite a lot in the portfolio and in fact as you grow you have some realizations but they they, they get older older and older and, and the bulk of what you have is unrealized stuff. So what, what makes it difficult as well to assess a track record is that most of what you presented is usually unexited. And these are private investments. So we don't have an official price for them. And it's the person raising the money that is telling you what in his or her opinion things are worth. So that obviously uh, uh, put all the, <laughs> the flags red, right? You, you, so. Okay, now we, we've seen lots of private equity pitches <clears throat> and you, you always get the IRR. Um, how well do IRRs capture the economic results delivered by a fund? So the, the IRR is, is, is one of these shortcuts I was talking about earlier. So there's no way you can measure a rate of return in a fund. So the IRR is making an assumption uh, to give you a number. And that assumption is pretty like, like if, we can describe it mathematically if you're interested, but it's actually very complex. So like the example I gave you earlier of the free cash flows by hand, uh, and I have a math degree, I cannot calculate the IR, okay? It's, it, 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 it's very complex. So Excel does it like, it's a code, um, it's a loop, uh, but Excel calculates to calculate an IR, et cetera. So it, it's pretty uh, uh, demanding as a calculation. And basically the way the IR is solved is that this assuming that anything that has been observed in between in terms of cash flows has been reinvested at the rate that the IR uh, says right. or is. And so this is how you manage to boil down to two cash flows. Again, you can calculate the rate of return if you have only two cash flows. So the IR, what it is solving basically saying, if I put all the cash flows and I reinvest them at, at, an, at the rate of X, how can I end up with a rate of return that is the same as the IR? Right, so you have one equation into a known. So you say each unknown is would be, they would be equal. What would be the answer? Right, so you can solve that, but not by hand. So when you see, so the short answer to the question is, when you see an IR that is below zero, it's actually never shown. It's actually you can see that they have lost money and they were not meaningful neck instead of the IR. And they are correct. The IR is not meaningful because what it would assume is that each time they distributed you money you burnt some of it every year, right? Because if IR is negative, it means that every year you get a negative rate of return on your reinvestment. So somebody gave you $100 million, if IR is minus 10, every year you just burn $10 million out of his pot, right? This makes no sense. So people are right. They never report a negative IR. They say it's not meaningful. And they're correct. It exaggerates with bad returns. For, but the, for the very same reason, any IR above 15% is not meaningful. Because there is no way you would have reinvested the money at more than 15%. So most of the IRs you will see at like 30%. Uh, none of these numbers are meaningful. So this is usually because uh, in the beginning of a fund's life, somebody has made some good deals. Otherwise, they die. They stop raising money. Right. So at the beginning of, of somebody's track recall, it's always good by definition. And so this is assumed to have been reinvested at a very high rate, which then gives you a stupid... Uh, answer. And you end up in situations like what I've pointed out, where KKR, since they are publicly listed in 2006, every year they tell you they have 26% IR. Well, they don't even call it IR. They say we have 26% annualized performance since 1976. And you say, that's amazing because like from 2006 to today, 16 years, and every year you have 26% since 1976. It's extraordinary. The reason for that is that they were at 26% in the late 70s. But this amount they have distributed is supposed to have compounded at 26%. And if you compound something at 26% for 40 years, it's worth trillions. So then it is assumed that these dividends that KKR did distribute in the late 70s are worth nowadays trillions. And so no matter what KKR does in terms of real performance over the last 10 or 15 years, you're supposed to be sitting on trillions. So it doesn't matter. And that's why then the, the performance doesn't move. So the IR does all kinds of weird things. But if you want to have a simple rule of thumb, when you see an IR presented to you, if it's a number between 2 3% and 
go for it. It's fine. It gives you an idea of what the rate of return was. If it's outside of this, of, of this range, then it's very tricky. You need to look very closely and more, more often than not, it's going to be a stupid number. So are there alternative approaches to evaluating performance? So none that will give you a rate of return, right? Because again, the, 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 the problem is if I have separate cash flows, more than two cash flows, I don't know what the rate of return is. I suspect that before the advent of, of, of continuously trading uh, assets, people didn't think about rates of returns. I, I, I was not there in the 17th century, but I'm pretty sure that people would talk about things like, you know, you can double your money in eight years or things like that, right? And it's really since things are continuously traded, but people then compound at the daily frequency, weekly frequency, monthly frequency, and I've, they've been then, uh, uh, they are now thinking only in rates of returns. And that, that they find it difficult to think, okay, is, is doubling my money in eight years a good deal or not? Um, so the closest alternatives that are advised in like in any textbook is to use uh, net present values or present values. And so um, present values, it, you have this public market equivalence, which is a ratio of present values that academics tend to use. That's a lot better. But now what we see people doing in practice is that they call public market equivalence things that are like differences between IRs. And they just call it public market equivalent because they say, oh, you've been told that PME, public market equivalent, is the right thing to do. So I did a difference of IR and I'm going to call that PME, so then I should be good. I'd be like, no, you're not good. This is, this is an IR. Like, go back to uh, the normal way of defining present values. Um, so yeah, we have better ways, but we don't have an ideal way. And that's why the bad way persists, is because we don't have an ideal way. And is there any standardization? Like you mentioned the Morningstar analogy. Is there anything like that in private equity? Huh. Uh, okay, w w within the holdings of, a, say, say, a buyout fund, what are the typical characteristics? Like if we were to use public markets as, as an analogy, like what's the company size, relative price, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, so if we are U.S. leverage buyouts, uh, we are talking mainly <clears throat> about something that would be a small cap, and that used to be a value stock in the 2000s, 90s, 2000s. But the last 10 years, it would be a growth stock. So mm -hmm. what has been incredible with, with leverage buyouts in the US is that the last 12 years, one third of the deals were in software, it's just software alone. One third of the volume of buyouts in the US. Right? Wow. If you still open any textbook, they will tell you in a, in a leverage buyout, we take like an industrial company, we make it better, or like we take energy, but Nabisco, we, we, we break the conglomerate. It, it will always be stories about companies that are cash rich and badly managed, and you take them over and you manage them better. In the last 12 years, like you get like software companies and like all kinds of tech companies and biotechs and like and 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 you 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 do mergers, you do a lot of, of M and activities on them, and, and um, so it's a very different uh, type of of investment. So in the US, leverage buyout. Small value 90, for the 90s and 2000s, small growth uh, last 12 years. Um, if, it's, if it's outside of the US, it tends to be growth equity. So it tends to be much less debt and it tends to be then mid cap and again, growth companies. Uh, you wouldn't get much hmm. investments in value companies outside of the US. Um, outside of the US, it would be fast growing companies in which you inject equity to make them grow faster. That's why also outside of the US and the UK, um, the, 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 the image of private equity is also a bit different and, and it's not quite the same kind of investment. So it's, it's country, country dependent, but also type of asset dependent. So like a venture capital, uh, yeah, a small cap NASDAQ probably will be close to that in the US. Outside of the US, you wouldn't really have an equivalent. So there are many um, subcategories that do not have equivalents as well. So how does one choose the best benchmark for evaluating your private equity? Yeah, so that makes it easy in the US leverage buyout because you could say, well, if I don't want to do like value versus growth tilt, at least like if I do a small cap, mid cap, public equity, I should be in the ballpark of okay with leverage buyout US. And I think that's fair enough and that, that, that's fine. I think that leverage buyout is so big in the US compared to venture capital and the rest, that even if you said all of private markets US, all of these private market funds, you include venture capital and, 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 and real assets and everything. And I would benchmark it against small cap, mid cap, US stock market index. You would probably still be about all right. 
Um, when you go out of the US, then there is just, you, you cannot do that. You have to go like fine tune tremendously. Hmm. So for example, if you were to do it in Europe, the main European publicly listed indices, um, 15% are Swiss stocks. Um, 15% are banks. Uh, 15% is food companies. Another 15% is oil and gas. There is no way the practically in investments in Europe are 15% in, in Switzerland and, and, and this proportion across the different industries I've given. It's actually zero in Switzerland, near zero in Switzerland, and near zero in all three industries I just gave. And that, that would be already like half of like what the European public equity landscape. So in Europe, if you want to benchmark private equity, you really have to go at the level of a country, country by country, and try to find the best possible match in terms of industry. Um, but you would have difficulties because even if you do that, it would be a great progress, but it would still be difficult because imagine that you know, most investments, again, in private equity in like France, Spain, et cetera, is going to be more like tech focused. There's no tech companies that are listed on these countries. And then if you start going to other geographies, like even uh, China, uh, where private equity is massive and it's mainly venture capital, uh, there's, no, there's not much Chinese stocks to, to compare it to. Um, and then you can go to countries as well where there's hardly any public markets uh, and you will have some private equity activity. Take even like the all of African continent, there's quite a lot of private equity activity compared to, to stocks listed. So and you certainly won't have any benchmark. Yeah, that's super interesting. So it's not just the characteristics, it's also the sector mix of the benchmark that can yeah, affect yeah, it. Yeah. yeah it's super it's been very important because the last 10 years with tech going through the roof and during the COVID mm -hmm. as well with tech and, and healthcare going through the roof, this is exactly the two industries that private equity was massively uh, invested in. They had the other third was roughly leisure and so that they got negatively hit by. But but like if you don't take into account the sector composition, you, you, you get it completely wrong, especially like with the recent movements, it was really like sector dominated. 10 years of like huge increase in prices for tech accelerated during the, 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 the COVID. And right now the crash that has happened over the last six months is mainly tech stocks being dumped uh, and, and, and value companies doing well. So they, they, the, the, the industry has been a key driver of, of returns. Wow. But what about leverage? Like if we're talking about buyouts, do you have to adjust a public equity benchmark for leverage? It's tricky because if, when, when people do that, they, they, they use a formula, which is basically, if I had borrowed money to invest more in public equity, I would have got a higher return on average. Yes, but, but it's like buying stocks on the margin. And, and then if you simulate any such strategy, you would have been bankrupted five times or 10 times mm -hmm. over the last 20 mm -hmm. years. It is it's tri totally not trivial to just like lever up public equity. And private equity does use a high amount of leverage, but leverage is structured in such a way that it's fairly robust. So I wrote a case study on Hilton Hotel, for example, where Blackstone gets Hilton Hotel private. Hilton Hotel is valued by the stock market at $20 billion right before Blackstone takes it over. And Blackstone borrows $20 billion that they put on, 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 on Hilton Hotels as debt. So imagine that the company like Hilton Hotels gets debt to pay that is 20 billion and that's what the market was saying this is the value of the entire thing and that's on their book mm -hmm. and then they get hit by 2008 like if they could have put half of this debt and they would have been wiped out and of course they were they were in, in in bankruptcy like a year later and blackstone manages to convince people that look they know how to run a hotel the lenders do not it's a very mm -hmm. big company it requires specific skills so blackstone managed to stay in control even though they were bankrupt and actually end up making money on the investment while the debt holders lost some. And so you end up making a return while if you would have just leveled up Marriott Hotel, you would have been bankrupt. Interesting. Even if you would have leveled it just 20% instead of 80%. Yeah. So you cannot really compare the two leverage. So when we try to estimate from the cash flow patterns, what kind of beta is most consistent with these patterns we see, it's not quite what would be the equivalent of, of very high leverage in public equity, but it is like a beta of 1.3 up to 1.5 in certain studies. So you should adjust for the extra risk there is in leverage buyout, but it's not as much as what people usually think. Hmm. Interesting. What are the fees that private equity limited partners typically pay? 
Um, so I estimated them at about six to seven percent a year in leverage buyouts, uh, which is by far the highest of any sorts of assets. Um, it's probably more like a five percent in venture capital, a four percent in real estate infrastructure, uh, a three, three and a half for like private debt, etc. So it's going to depend on the exact products, also less in emerging market private equity funds, but. Um, most of the money goes into U.S. leverage buyout funds, and this is about 6-7% a year, historically. Um, it's important to know that we don't know the exact answer because nobody has ever disclosed the fees that they have paid on the investor side. They have always disclosed them only partially, even to this day. Uh, and the fund managers do not disclose really their fees, even if now that there are some that are listed, like KKR, and you try to go through their revenues and so on, you would have difficulties to like reconstitute how much per dollar invested or under management uh, is being charged because they always have money, but they haven't invested yet, but on which they get fees. And so it's, it, it, it's always quite difficult. But a 6 7% <laughs> estimate seems to be in the ballpark of reasonable. Uh, it's easy to also uh, reconstitute this number intuitively, given the typical fee structure. Um, it is never the number that is really cited. Uh, and I think that it should be, yeah. It's, wow. it's, it's a high number. So many investors aren't aware of what those fees are. No, not at all. And, and if you go by your funds of funds as well, and then it's even more. Um, no, people, have, people do not translate it this way. They will say, oh, I just pay the normal to 20. But they don't, they don't translate that into, okay, but what does that mean? What, what, are the, what are the less obvious fees that an LP might be paying? Um, for example, when a fund would not so we a fund wants to make an investment uh they um uh, they don't call the money from you like we said we, you, we would instead i'm going to borrow the bank uh, uh money the reason i do that is that then i can gain a bit my ir because if i don't call the money at the beginning of oh. the fund's life and i wait uh, until like some exits are very close to that i will recreate this illusion that i made an investment got some money quickly back in so it gives a high return and but we're going to assume it's going to be reinvested at this very high rate and the IR would go through the roof. So for example, if I um, borrow money at the bank, instead of calling the money from you, I'm going to, all the fees of the bank are going to be paid by you and, and you won't see it right? because I'm, I'm just going to call a bit more money next time and, 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 and take some of it to pay the bank. So that's the sorts of things you won't see. Um, something else I may do is that with your money, I bought uh, an apartment uh, but then, you know, and I'm collecting the rent for you, right? And then, but there is a week I, but I say, look, I did some consulting work on this apartment. I, I looked around and I changed the, the decoration, things like that. And I'm going to just keep the rent for the next three months for like consulting fees. And so I decide that I should pay myself, you know, for consulting fees because I, I, I worked on, 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 on this apartment. <laughs> and so that, that you, you, it, it used to be the case that the investors wouldn't see it at all. I did a lot of work on this, so now they're more aware of it, and they seem to, 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 um, to, to, to ask for more information about this. They obtained some of it, some, some of it uh, maybe not fully. Um, but these are the sorts of like non-obvious fees that, that people would pay. So the first one that they gave as an example is a fund expense. The second one is an example of a portfolio company fee. Um, and then you have even less obvious things, which would be, Imagine that uh, my fund specializes in uh, controlling hotels. So I, with your money, I buy, I buy hotels. Um, but my sister and I decided to create a company that um, buy mattresses and sell them to hotels. Uh, and just happened that all these hotels I control buy the mattresses via the company of my <laughs> sister and I. And because we buy a lot of mattresses, my sister and I buy the mattresses for $10. We sell them back to this hotel for $20. Of course, $20 is kind of like the market price if a single hotel was buying a mattress. Um, but I bought a lot of it. Mm. And if all these hotels would have got together and bought the mattresses, they got, would have got it for 10. So then it's kind of gray area, right? So it's not like an obvious fraud. I'm not, I'm not overcharging the hotel, but I'm doing bulk buying. And, and use the fact that I'm controlling uh, different companies to, 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 to make money personally. So mm -hmm. then indirectly, being your money went into the hotel who's paying $20 for the mattress. I could have arranged things differently and you would have paid $10 for a mattress. Uh, 
So in, you pay more costs than you should have had, and, and <laughs> this is money I'm taking away from you, and that is going to my sister and I. Wow. Um, so this would be probably like the less obvious fees. Yeah, that's very, very unobvious. Uh, what, what about carry? Like you mentioned 2 and 20, so you've got a performance fee in there. If a private equity fund does well and the investor, the LP, is paying carry, does that, does that mean that they've done well on the investment? Yes, but 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 it is people who have traded options know that it's very tricky to 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 judge options one by one. So you can very well have in a portfolio half of your funds that did well and half of them who did badly. The one half of did well, you give them twenty percent. The ones who did badly might have underperformed by as much as the one who did well. But if you 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 end up having paying carried and having a portfolio that is not doing very well, right? So. When you when you get options on individual assets, it 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 is quite costly compared to having an option on the basket, right? So a basket of options is is, is a lot more costly than, than an option on a basket. So few people, most people don't don't see that very well. Um, they don't have that intuition. Um, uh, so a priori, the, the, the carry sounds innocuous. Like I, I, they take twenty percent if they do well. But imagine that you have 100 monkeys who get 20% carry and doing random investments in stocks for you. You will say, well, I've paid only the monkeys that did well. And like, sure, but, but overall, you got the market portfolio and you ended up paying 20% to whichever half of the monkeys were lucky. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so one needs to be careful a bit with that. Like the carry is asymmetric and that creates issues at the portfolio level. Okay, we, we've talked about the the structure of funds and the process to invest and all that kind of stuff, the challenges with measuring performance. Given all that, what do we know about private equity performance relative to public equities? So that, a caveat first is that this is the past and, and it's more important to think about the future, but 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 it's, oh. it's good to have an idea of the past to, to but, but we should certainly not make investment decisions based on past returns. We know there is no relationship, but people keep on just being very obsessed with past and track records. Um, so in a nutshell, um, private equity in Europe has done much better than public equity in Europe, but the industry mix is completely different. So if I just tell you that public equity in Europe is banks, oil and gas, and things like that, and tell you they underperformed a portfolio of tech firms in Europe over the last 15 years, that shouldn't come as a surprise, right? So, um, so we don't know if industry corrected, that would be a different. Um, emerging markets about equal anyway, um, even the way it is. In the US, uh, there is this complexity with, with a large cap uh, that did very badly from 98 to 2008 and, and, and did normally after. So what happens in the US is that if you would take an index which is not including like the, the largest uh, uh, market caps, so anything like the S&P 400, S&P 600, or uh, some other indices, or you take like a dimensional fund advisor uh, returns, uh, things like that, or the CRISP, the Chicago indices, um, you would find that private equity was, was very close to, 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 to public equity uh, over any time period. <laughs> the problem is when you use the S&P 500, you have this very, so to give you an idea, like over the last 100 years in the US, if you take any size categories and you calculate their 10 years returns and you just roll it, right? You start in 1920 and you say, okay, 1920 to 1930, 1921 to 1931, you do this 10 years rolling for 100 years in the US. There is not a single category in this 10 size, D size that have ever had a decade with negative returns, except for one category in one decade. And it is the large cap, the largest cap, the top 10% from 98 to 2008. That's the only one. So it means that some, an index like the S&P 500 has an, has an extremely low performance from 98 to 2008. So up until 2008, whenever you would see an investment presentation, it would be benchmarked against the S&P 500 because it was like trivial to beat the S&P 500. So people keep on playing with that. So when, when they show you the last 10 years of performance in private equity in the US, they will never show it to you against the S&P 500 because it's going to be close to one to one. When they bring in the S&P 500, it's going to be the past 20 or 30 years because then it's going to include the 98 to 2008 time period. Hmm. If they're going to show you a recent period, they're going to use MSCI World because it's the worst performing index over the last 10 or 15 years. 
But if throughout someone would have used a stable index like S&P 400 or, or, or something like that, you would have seen that any horizon, it would be very close to, 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 to the public equity in the US. Uh, and like I said, in the US, the mix is pretty similar. So it, 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 it is a reasonable comparison. Um, so it's not bad returns. And if, if private equity has been a bit diversifying, net of all fees, if you get about the same as public equity, it actually hasn't been a bad deal. Uh, it's not the amazing deal that the consultants are selling to you, but it hasn't been a bad deal. Um, now, uh, going forward, one has to think about whether a high fee in a low interest rate environment is a good idea, right? So if you're going to have lower expected returns, even if private, private, private equity outperforms the public mm -hmm. market's gross of fees, and they do, you have a very high fee structure, and so in a compressed return environment, how does that work, right? So usually it's not very good news. So um, that's why I encourage people to think more from fundamentals about the future rather than just looking at the track because it wasn't bad in the past, so, so it's cool. But it's still important to know that in the past is not as rosy as what consultants tell you. Is that, so you, you mentioned earlier, looking forward at expected returns, is that all there is to it, that it's, it's high fees and a low, uh, a low interest rate environment? Or? Because go, it, it, the rest is, is highly speculative. Um, it's hard to say, you know, that, that would be my number one. Uh, my number two, that would be in the, in the order of like what is less speculative. So least speculative would be, you know, high fee, low, low uh, expected return usually is not a good mix. Um, and that's hard to disprove. The, the second one is that historically, so slightly more speculative, but there is some, some, some uh, research backing to that. Historically, any asset class, any sub-asset class that, has risk, that, that if you want to try to see what is the best predictor of, of their expected returns is the flow of money that went to it. So whenever you have a country, for example, that becomes on fashion, like think about the BRICS, for example, the Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, South Africa. In 2005, 2006, that was the place to go. Money was flowing in these countries like mad. Look at it today, 15 years later, how many of these countries offer the good return? Maybe China, and that even is not clear um, because it, it, it's really so-so. The other ones were in a catastrophe, right? So it, an absolute catastrophe. So the, the flow of money in any, about any asset class is the best predictor of expected return, right? So that doesn't mean it would continue this relationship, but it's pretty strong. So... Venture capital, for example, in the US, the best vintages, so the best moment to invest in venture capital was 2004, 5, 6, 7. I can tell you it was around back then. Nobody wanted to touch venture capital in 2004, 5, 6, or 7. There was very low flow of money. Why? Because people had been burned in the last 90s. So all the early 2000s, nobody wanted to invest in venture capital. And we saw very, very good vintage years. Now everybody is investing in venture capital in the US and wants to be there. So that tells me that this may not be very good. Um, European venture capital, nobody wanted to touch it until very few years ago, and, 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 and returns had been good for the vintages like 2010, 2014. Um, take private equity Africa, at one point was very much on fashion, like 08 or 09, didn't end up well. Um, so the, the, the places where you have like a lot of fashion and, and, and it's, it's usually when, when there is problems. You need to remember the, this old... Um, Americans say, which is when the shoe shine boy is telling you which stock to buy, where it's not, no better moment than to, to just sell everything and, 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 and go away, buy a house. <laughs> just sell, sell all your stocks and go, go, go buy a house, buy a lake. Um, it, you know, nowadays, if I, if, if, you know, a taxi driver would tell me, you know, that, that they want to invest in Blackstone or things like that, right? So, right. so it, 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 we need to be mindful of a long, uh, <laughs> this, this, this say. I, I'm going to ask you for a speculative number, and, and you don't have to give me one. But uh, if you were to assign uh, an expected return to private equity as an asset class, uh, maybe just relative to, to public equities, would it be above or below? I think it's going to be very close, maybe a bit below because of the higher fees, but but I see it as very close. Um, okay. I, I really don't see oh. how it is possible to outperform net of fees with this fee structure in a lower room expected return environment and, and they are paying high prices for assets. So, mm. but, you, but you never know because like, look, the COVID hit and they were supposed to, to die. If you're high level, then you're hit by a shock, but then the government decide to rescue everyone. So right. good. Um, 
Now you have like this massive inflation, all kinds of problems on portfolio companies, but maybe the inflation will wipe out their debt. And so maybe they will end up all right. Um, I don't think this is the most likely scenario, but you never know. Um, so I think the average scenario would tell me that it's, it's going to be very tricky. How successful has investing in private equity been for, you know, the institutional investors of the world? If you look at pension funds in the US, for example, where you can get data, it's amazingly close. If you look at, so the IR would be like 11%. So when it's at 11%, you kind of, kind of, you can trust it. So like CalPERS is at like 10.5. So that's a reasonable number. And remember by US stocks, you can check it. The average stock in the US, again, not, not the S&P 500, that will depend on the horizon, but the average stock in the US will be at about 10, 11% on any five to 10 years period. So, um, that squares up with what I just described. And if you look at the multiple of money, CalPERS reports that they got $1.5 for every dollar invested. What is, what is interesting is that it's not all pension funds report their IR and, and they didn't all start at the same time. There can be some complexity there. But the multiple of money is a good number to compare across pension funds. And they nearly all of them have 1.45 as a multiple of money in private equity. And you take, you take Washington, Oregon, which are the oldest investors in private equity in the US. You take newer ones, they're all at 1.5, 1.45. Like it's incredibly close. Um, so it seems to be the thing. And 1.4, 1.5 is what you get if you invest in about for four years at 10% a year. That's exactly what you get. So we know what they've got is what I just said. They got about 10% a year. And so these pension funds as well, one mistake they make often or willingly or not, or the, the consultants certainly push it this way, willingly, is that then they say in private equity, we have 10, 11% return at about any horizon, which is not bad and they're right. And, but in public equity is much less. And there the mistake is their public equity is globally diversified, not their private equity. So their private equity is mainly US, and so their private equity did as well as US public equity investment by pension fund. But the rest of the market, the US dollar has appreciated. And, and the, so if you take MSCI World, it has very bad returns in US dollars. And so pension funds in their public equity positions have roughly the MSCI World index. And so then they, their returns are much less than private equity. But all you need to do is split. And sometimes they do report that you take a pension fund and say, you look at American public equity versus non-American private equity, uh, public equity. And you will see that their private equity portfolio is very close in returns to the American private public equity, but indeed much higher than their non-US public equity, but that's because of the US dollar and like idiosyncratic things, nothing to do with private equity doing better. So when you observe the portfolio of pension funds and their returns, it's actually very coherent with all the numbers I gave. Hmm. Well, you mentioned the, the huge firms like Blackstone and KKR, uh, how does their performance compare to like the average private equity fund. Yeah, so I haven't done it for a long time. I always resisted to take a name, not to pick like someone. And uh, so I did in this paper on, on the billionaire factory because I wanted, because people kept on saying, well, I, I, I don't believe you or, you know, but at least the top quarter will do better, you know, like. Yeah. And so at first people say, I don't believe you. And I say, go on the website of CalPERS and to do all the patient funds one by one, look at the numbers and we see it's 10, 11% written there. It's not 30%, okay, it's 10, 11. That's what is written. Um, and then people say, well, but they are top quartiles, okay? Like, like CalPERS is stupid. I say, well, I, I, I disagree, but, but, but fine. Okay, they are top quartiles. So who are these top quartiles? And they always come up with these names. Like, oh, KKR is at 30% return, Apollo 26. Apollo is at 40% return, also fees, et cetera. So I say, okay, then let's take these names. Let's take that track record because it's in public filing. So you will be able to check yourself. So it's not my own numbers, okay? Let's go on the SEC filings and let's look at the numbers. What's amazing is that these guys never give the multiple of money net of fees, which would be like the only thing that is making some sense, right? They report a net of fees IR, but as we discussed, it's not very helpful. So uh, the net of fees of KKR is at 26. The net of fees of Apollo is at 30. Uh, the net of fees of Blackstone is at 19, et cetera. So, and Kala is at 17. So this, this is not particularly interesting. These are IRs, right? We know it, it, it is not quite right. So, but and if you look at the multiple of money, you don't have a net of fees. So it's not very helpful to know how much they make gross of fees. We know it's a lot of gross of fees, but they're incredibly close to one another. So gross of fees, they are all close to two. 
And if you make twice the money in gross of fees, you can calculate how much you know, normal fees are to see where you are net. And you end up at 1.5, which is exactly what all the pension funds are reporting. And most of the money of pension funds is invested with KKR, Blackstone, and all these guys. So it's all, again, completely coherent. You go to the SC filings of GPs. If you don't look at the big numbers, they flash you away. But you look at, you, you, you dig out the ones that are, you know, more difficult to, 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 to uh, put glitter on, you, you'll find coherent numbers. Again, it's not bad, the returns. Huh? The past returns are not bad. But it's, but it's not what, what marketers call it consultants all the time. And, and the other one a lot of listeners will, will are probably wondering about right now is, what about Yale? Yeah, so Yale had reported an IR for many years. They had never said so. And then I gave them a very hard time about that. And then now they put it all over their annual reports in the footnotes and the like, saying this, in, this is an IR, so you need to treat it with caution, blah, blah, blah. Me, I would just not put it in the annual report. And I would ask them to still put like a, a, a money multiple. I would like to know what is the money multiple of Yale. They never reported it. Any investment professional, when you tell them IR is BS, they tell you, oh, yeah, but you, you have a money multiple next to it. So then that, that this is how you, hmm. you can have a better assessment of performance. Say, well, what is the money multiple of Yale? We don't know. Nobody has ever told us. It would be good to know. Hmm. I'm sure it's decent because they are very small. They did the number of choices that were very small. But, um, but we don't know their, 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 their money multiple. So, uh, and, and, and even less so their PME. I don't know. I'm sure it's, it's decent, but uh, it's certainly not the 30% that is advertised because this is an IR. So we know it's not that. We don't know the real number. Hmm. You may have answered this when you talked about the U.S. and non-U.S. for, for comparing performance, but why, why do we hear that private equity has been the best performing asset class for institutions? Yeah, so this is exactly the thing. So that Because okay. they, 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 they merge together all public equity and private equity, and you have a tilt that in private equity is mainly U.S., and in public equity is mainly uh, it's quite a bit. Half is non-U.S. for the average institution in the U.S. Um, and so with dollar strengthening and, and some emerging market not doing very well over the last 10, 20 years, um, you get that result. It's, it's totally, uh, totally mechanical. So do you believe that private equity offers diversification benefits to a public equity portfolio? It's reasonable to think so. It's reasonable to think so. Uh, the question is to which extent? And, and then is when you need to do a bit more homework that some private equity funds one can see intuitively we offer diversification, but if you see some private equity firms investing in something like Hilton Hotels and you have a Marriott that is publicly listed in terms of diversification, I'm not sure, but it helps me to buy into Hilton on the private equity side when I can have Marriott on the public equity side. Um, so it depends on the strategy. So, so usually overall, if the larger a fund is, the more they invest in mainstream type of companies and so the, the more similar they are to, to publicly traded ones. So if you want to look for diversification, you would tend to go towards more niche fund, the most like construction, right? Somebody doing software in Europe, I guess there's no such thing that are publicly listed. So yes, that would be diversifying. I don't know if it's a good return or not, but, but that would be diversifying. Oh yeah, okay, no, that's, that's an, interesting, an interesting way to think about it. I, you, you mentioned Hilton, I, I, I gotta ask about it. Um, that that seems like the the best the best thing that private equity ever did for investors. Do, do you think that the LPs benefited benefited from that deal? No, so I, I updated the case and now it's it's on SSRN.com. Um, we 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 did very careful calculations, uh, very detailed. It's a case study we use with students to show the importance of benchmarking property. On paper, it's the largest capital gain ever. Uh, it's ten billion of capital gain plus. Actually, it's more than that. And and it's interesting to see that, you know, if you try to reconstitute how much went to the LPs, it's close to what they would have got with Marriott. So they, they got zero, really. They actually they underperform Marriott, if you, even if you do like reasonable fee estimates. And so this massive capital gain is all down to Marriott went up by as much. Um, Blackstone took more than $2 billion in fees. The management took a half a billion in, 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 in compensation. Uh, the selling shareholders got to tons of money. So lots of people receive money, but, but, but the LPs, it looks like it was a bit rough for them. Yeah, that, that case study is fascinating because uh, 
it, it's like I said, it's like that. That's what's the the, the the showcase for private equity. Like, look, uh, look what you could have participated in. Uh, g- given what we talked about so far, why why do you think sophisticated investors are are allocating to private equity? Because one should not use the name sophisticated so much. Is that the hmm. people people are driven by 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 all kinds of objectives when they are managing other people's money. Right? So. If I'm working for a pension fund and I'm a private equity specialist, I, I spent 25 years in private equity. Am I going to go to the board of pension fund and say, you know, like these numbers you hear in the press by consultants and stuff, they're not very really real. Okay, it's not that good. And there are all these fees we don't know about and stuff. Like, take it easy. What are they going to do? They're going to shrink my division, maybe even fire me. They're going to stop investing in private equity. So if I know about private equity and all these things, I, you know, I'm not going to make noise, okay? I'm just going to say it's okay. It's under control. We're monitoring it. It's fine, right? And I'm going to go to the board and say, look at this consultant report. They say we should invest more in private equity. Why don't you add a few more people to my team and give me more money? So it, it, it's because there is this naive, port- I mean, it could be also willing that, that people say, oh, but it's sophisticated people playing with sophisticated people. So it should all be good. Like in my, the first paper I, I, I wrote, 20 years ago, people said, you know, it, it was showing that the, the returns were not very good. And people said, like, it, it cannot be because these are like willing adults signing contracts with one over. So, you, but, and, and, they are, and people are still investing in these guys. So you can only be wrong, right? Because why would they invest, right? So, so it, and, and so it's this, it just, the world is a bit more complicated than that. There's all kinds of conflicts of interest. There is all kinds of uh, other objectives that people are following. And investing in private equity is a lot more exciting than, than, than investing in bonds. So like, you know, if I do a show of hand for my students, nobody wants to do fixed income or ETFs mm. or things like that. I want to do private equity. It's a lot more exciting. I don't blame them. I would do the same. Do, do you think that there's, is there a way that investors can approach private equity to, to expect to be successful? Yeah, there are some exceptions. So, uh, Oxford Endowment, for example, is is probably my my favorite investor in private equity. I invite the the deputy CIO of Oxford Endowment every year to my lecture to explain his approach to private equity. They invest a lot in it, um, and I and I find him making complete sense. Uh, but he invests is not too far from David Swenson philosophy. He invests with very niche private equity funds. That's one thing. Um, so David Swenson never invested in big names. He never invested into the Blackstone, KKR, etc. And, and neither does Oxford Endowment. So they invest in very niche people where they can see that there is a case for outperformance and the case is really spelled out, etc. They don't say, oh, you have a good track record, I'm giving you money. It's like, explain to me why going forward, n- you have identified a cake, but there is indeed a cake and nobody will come and eat it instead of you. Explain that to me, right? And I think this is very important. People should spend much less time looking at track records and much more time doing what I just described, which is much more difficult. It's just probably why they prefer to focus on track records instead. So, um, so they invest in things that are very niche and they, um, they use their, uh, their competitive advantage, which is that when you're a Yale endowment or Oxford endowment, your name can, can help the GP uh, quite a bit. And so they tend to be then in a strong position to write contracts with the GPs that are, that are aligning interest much better. Um, they, 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 the GP is not going to like, you know, do things on their, in their back or things like that, because this is like a very important anchor investor. So they, they, they are in a, and, and, and they get to see a number of, of things. They, they get also to talk to people. Uh, it, it sounds silly, but if you, it, if you pick up the phone and say, this is Oxford Endowment, and, and I have a question about your, your ex-employer, can, can we talk about that? People say, yeah, sure, let's have a talk. If I call and say, I'm Ludo, I'm trying to invest in this fund, I would like to, like, you're not, you're not picking up the phone. Okay? It, it, it sounds silly, but it, it does happen. If David Swenson calls you to ask you a question when, when he was alive, he would pick up the phone, right? People would. And um, according to the people here at, at Oxford Endowment, you obtain incredible amounts of information by talking to people. So for example, um, an example that he gave in, in, in my class was, you have a fund sending you a prospect, it still looks good, they were very interested, and the fund says that like, 
all of their deals are proprietary, right? It's a classic uh, thing. They, 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 it's always one to one. They have this niche and they do very well. So they are, they are very interested in that. That's you know that answers like the sorts of questions I just gave earlier. And so they, they call you know the, the the investment banker that was dealing with his, with, with his uh, acquisition and the one that was dealing with that other acquisition, etc. I say, how did it go this this sale? What 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 happened? And say, well, you know. Uh, we had a good file, you know, at the auction, we could do blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, there was an auction. Okay, tell me about the auction, right? And and if you don't have access to these guys, and you don't know, you say, well, so apparently these guys pretend that it's all proprietary. So not only it's not the case, but on top of that, they lied to me, right? So that's a no. Hmm. So, 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 so I, I do know some LPs that are, it's making sense when they explain why and how they invest in private equity. I just don't know that many of them, but, but, but there are some, yes. So if an investor does not want to invest in private equity, can they rep, uh, replicate those returns in public equities? I, I created a, an, an index that was, that's making it pretty closely, I think, and making lots of sense. Um, it's, it's, it's currently not available uh, to uh, the broad public. I'm, I'm, I was talking to, to, to a firm to make it an ETF, but with a recent market turmoil, uh, it was put on hold. Um, but if anybody is interested, um, that's, that's, that's feasible. We, um, this index was developed by JP Morgan, so it, 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 but it's for large institutional investors if you're interested. But we, we, we found that like, you can put a, together a portfolio of about 100 publicly listed companies in the world that are involved with private equity. And if you're quite smart at doing your liquidity management and you're waiting, um, you could get a portfolio that is very close to what Cambridge Associate returns are. Interesting. And you said that that index is available for large investors? Yeah. So if you're a JP Morgan client, you could see the index live on Bloomberg. Um, if you're not, you cannot see it yet, but I'm, 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 I'm updating the paper that has, has been posted on SSRN where I, I will even try to put it on my website in a few months, hopefully, the, the index live so that you can track uh, private equity live. So the, the irony is that I started working on this index uh, in 2020. And, and when it was ready, it was about like May 2020. And um, it was still under embargo um, at, at JP Morgan because they wanted to try to sell it before it, it would be known what the methodology is r roughly. And so they kept it at the embargo for 18 months. And during these 18 months, my index went up by more than 80%. <laughs> And, 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 but if you looked at private equity returns as well, they went through the roof, right? If you take from the pandemic or afterwards, they also went through the roof. So we, we saw some private equity guys announcing that even on NAV to NAV basis, their return were up 50, 60, 70%, but so did my index. Hmm. Um, but over the last month or two, my index is down quite a bit, right? But again, it's making sense. Like private equity is quite down. Um, they have difficulties raising money. People are very nervous about the expected returns. So it, it seems to be going in the right direction with the right magnitudes. Uh, and in the past, when you, we can backtest it to 2008, all the movement seems to be making sense. And the average return matches exactly the Cambridge Associates average return. My main index has an average return of 30, 13%. That's super interesting. All right, Ludo, Ludo, the last question we have for you, how do you define success in your life? To be happy. <laughs> People need to find something that makes them happy. That's a great answer. <clears throat> I, 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 I want to ask you, I, I had a bonus question, and I'm, uh, just real quick, quick answer, because uh, we talk about the value premium a lot. Uh, is the value premium risk-based or behavior-based? Uh, I, I, I lean towards behavior-based, ba um, because I don't see the story of like value gives you more return because these are riskier companies. If I look at the list of companies that are value and i look at the list of companies that are growth i have a very hard time to define what kind of risk it is that these value companies have and the growth ones don't huh. um, if i give you a list of growth companies like tesla and and and, and, and all these things um, i'm not sure i feel a lot safer investing in these that i would in walmart so uh <laughs> i don't see how a value premium could be a compensation for risk. no uh, interesting and you've got papers on this too we can we can link to those yeah. Awesome. Ludo, this has been fantastic. We really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I, your, your stuff on private equity is just, uh, it, it's, it's so good. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks for the lesson. Thank you.